All right, the next uh, speaker is a, a radio host. He's got million, I forgot the exact number, but he'll repeat it for you. Millions and millions of uh, listeners uh, in uh, Canada and the uh, US. Um, and the uh, radio station that he's hosting is uh, called Frito Main Radio. Uh, a warm welcome for Stéphane Molinier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you don't need it, right? Yeah. Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for coming out to Bitcoin versus political power. I have a technology background, which is probably why I managed to slip into the conference. I was an entrepreneur for about 15 or so years in the high-tech field, and then I got bitten by the philosophy bug. I studied philosophy uh, at a graduate level in Canada, and uh, I ended up running the show. We have about 65 million downloads. I've been on TV. I speak all over the world. And since about 2011, uh, I've been really talking up Bitcoin. Now, uh, just curious, how many people have Bitcoins? I don't mean on them. I'm just curious how many people have Bitcoins. OK, good. <laughs> good for you. How many people are interested in getting Bitcoins? Not that I have any on me to provide, but OK, good. And I'm going to make a case here. I mean, Bitcoin is great technology. It's genius code. Uh, this, this public ledger of value transfer and uh, information, copyright, deeds, wills, almost anything you can think of can be implemented in the Bitcoin architecture. It is one of the greatest innovations, I think, in human history. It's a lot to say, but I'll hopefully make the case here. And one of the things it has the power to do is to limit the seemingly endless growth of political power that literally appears to be eating up the world, eating up the next generation. The unfunded liabilities of the US government are estimated at over $100 trillion. That's on a GDP of $15 trillion. Can't possibly pay it, even here in the Netherlands. Unfunded liabilities, the Social Security pensions, all the stuff the government has promised to pay for but has no cash to pay for is 522% of GDP. That's not good. That's not good at all. And there's a reason why that has occurred. And the reason is because governments can print any money that they want. That's their business plan. I've got a bank account, I've got a keyboard, I'm going to type some numbers in. Look, I'm a business genius. That's what they're doing. And that takes away power from the people. A study just came out yesterday from Princeton and Northwestern University that proves, I think, what we all feel instinctively to be true. But they did a study in America. And they said, what are the political beliefs or, or, or preferences of the American population? And what has the government done? Was it this close? <laughs> it was not. This, this. They couldn't, you know, it was like watching a guy tell you how big the fish was he caught in Narnia. They couldn't find a further gap. Now, business interests, financial interests, they had the ear of the government. The people did not. It's an oligopoly. It's a plutocracy. We all know this to be true. And I'm going to argue that it is fiat currency that enables that in the government. And it is Bitcoin that can stop it and stop a lot more besides. 2,500 years ago, Aristotle, known as a very smart cookie, defined money as four, having four characteristics. It had to be uh, portable, right? You know, lead coin, and, uh, right? <laughs> can't do that. Uh, it had to be uh, long-lasting, and to uh, not fade away, not lose uh, its uh, value. It had to be divisible, right? You can cut it up, reassemble it. And it had to have intrinsic value. And its most important intrinsic value was that it was limited, limited. Now, I'm sure you guys know, what was the original money back in the day? Solid gold. That's right, not just a great TV show, but a very, very fine basis for currency. Of course, nobody under 40 knows that reference. <laughs> okay, never mind. So, gold has those properties. It lasts long, you can slice it up, it retains its value, you can reassemble it, and it has intrinsic value because people like it. It's shiny, it's pretty, and all that. 
So Bitcoin, of course, lasts. It's digital. Bitcoin is divisible, right? There will be 21 million Bitcoins. They could divided, be divided by 100 million each into these Satoshis. And uh, I think that's about as many pennies as there are in the world economy. So we're not going to run out of money anytime soon. And it is limited. And I know this sounds like very abstract, maybe even annoying intellectual economic abstractions, but the limits of money, the limiting of money, is the limiting of political power. We have these governments, and we believe that they're necessary, but they are considered to be great servants and terrible masters. <clears throat> we create them for security. We create them for <clears throat> defense, for dispute resolution through the court system. And then they seem to do everything else under the known universe, and they run up enormous debts, and they start wars, and they sell off the unborn to foreign banksters, and we can't control the government when we need to. We try to vote, we try to uh, rally, we try to have activism, and we cannot control this beast of the state. Anybody know how many Occupy Wall Street protesters ended up in jail? Anyone know that number? About 2,500. 2,500. The bankers in the United States are estimated, if you take out some of the government spending that's tried to remediate the damage, estimated to have destroyed about 40% of America's wealth. 40% of the wealth of the wealthiest country destroyed by a financial oligopoly who were clearly breaking, breaking laws repeatedly. Does anybody know how many Bankers went to jail. Yeah, big fat goose egg, a bagel. Zero. Remember Mitt Romney? Corporations are people, my friend. No, people go to jail. Corporations never go to jail because they give money to the government. Barack Obama was elected because it took the most money of any political candidate ever in history from the financial sector. And in return, he extends the TARP uh, bailout. And banks that made hundreds of millions of dollars lying to their customers, selling them financial instruments that they were actually betting against, well, they get slap on the wrist fines that basically get passed off as costs to their customers. They pay nothing. We cannot control this monster. In the 19th century, we're also used to inflation here. It's crazy. Like, I came to Amsterdam, and my wife told me it was going to rain all week. Turns out it's quite sunny. I don't want to get full-on tomato head, so I went to get some sunscreen. Like, $30 is like 20 euros for sunscreen and all that. I, I thought it was going to be like gold and turn me into C-3PO or something, but it's just crazy expensive. When I first came to Canada in 1977, a candy bar cost 10 cents. You know, within 10 to 12 years, it was up to a buck. Inflation is just something we're so used to. In the 19th century, when gold was the basis of currency, prices went down. Can you imagine that? Don't we all feel like our money is just kind of evaporating? You know, like it's like grapes left out for ants to eat. Like you put it under your bed, and it just smolders and vanishes. It's one of the reasons why we put money in banks, why we invest in the stock market. It's just a hedge against inflation. In the 19th century, when money was limited by gold, prices went down for a 100 years in general. Everything was a computer. Everything got better and cheaper over time. We, we, can't, we can't fathom this anymore. But that's how it used to be, when money was limited. Now, what happened in the 19th century was rich people, not all rich people, but rich people in general want to privatize profits and socialize losses, right? Ooh, I made some good money. Yay, all mine. Fine, I'm fine. Down with property rights, good thing, right? Ooh, did I lose some money? <gasps> Can we find a couple of taxpayers? Maybe they're kids. Maybe they're unborn. They're not voting yet. Let's do that. And in the 19th century, people put money into banks. Now they're already making money just by sitting on it because prices were going down. But they put their money in banks. Now, how do banks give you interest? They don't have any money other than what they're given. They're not entrepreneurs in the way most of the audience members here are. So banks lend money out to other people. And then those people make money and pay back the bank. And then the bank gives you a couple of points on your deposits. 
Fine business model, no problem with it at all. But in the 19th century, banks had the capacity for failure, of course, right? Because sometimes you invest, you give a whole bunch of people making carriages a lot of money, and then, oh, some jerk invented the car. Damn. Buy to that money. And you lose a lot of money. And of course, banks maybe make one or two percentage points on a loan, which means for every loan that fails, between 50 and 100 have to succeed perfectly. So it's a very risky business. So banks were competing for customers, and they always wanted to be able to offer more interest. Now, how could they do that? Well, fractional reserve banking. Boy, there's a phrase that will get people to flock to you at dinner parties. I know about fractional reserve banking. Would you like to sit next to me? So the banks wanted to offer more interest, so they had to lend out multiples. Right? They got a ton of gold, they lend out five tons worth of money to people. And they hope that the law of averages is going to even it out and they're going to be OK. And, and you, no, a lot of times it did. And sometimes it didn't. Then people lost money. They lost money because they were greedy, because they wanted the bank to lend out more than it was holding. When the bank went bankrupt, a lot of rich people lost a lot of money. Where do they go? Oh, congressman. <laughs> They go to the state. Now, the problem is the state is a negative sum game. The state is the deal where they say, hey, I can give you five euros. And people are like, hey, I, I like euros. I'll take that. And they say, well, to give you the five euros, I need to tax you 10 euros first, if that's all right. And then people say, I think that deal just got away from me. I, I don't feel like that's going to work that well. because." You know, you're going to give someone 100 bucks, you go tax people a dollar each, 100 people, you've got to go pick up that money, and people aren't going to comply. You've got to have a court system, collection, IRS, all that. So it's a negative sum game. Some people think it's worth it. That's perhaps a conversation with other time. I'll be at the Q&A session afterwards. But it is a negative sum game. So if a bunch of rich people come to you and say, my bank went bust, give me some money. Well, you've got to go and raise taxes on a bunch of people. And they don't like that. See, when, when money is limited, when it's limited on gold, the government can't just make it up. It means if you want to transfer money, you have to go take it from someone first. And those people don't like it. And so governments are always trying to enrich people. They're always trying to break out of limited money, to get out of this little cage of limited money. And freedom for the government is enslavement for the people. We're talking about power to the people at this conference. When the government is free, the people are enslaved. When the government is contained, then the people are free. And when the government can print all the money that it wants, and when the government can create, in, in Canada, there's a province, it has 75-year bonds, right? Which means, give me money now, and in 75 years, someone will pay it back. I mean, there's no conceivable way that that could be considered just or fair or democratic. These people aren't even born yet, and you're taxing them. Picking the pocket of a fetus takes some pretty nimble fingers, but they can do it with fiat currency. To limit money is to limit political power. So prior to the First World War, Federal Reserve was created in America with the capacity to create money, which is, well, technically called counterfeiting. <laughs> but in the annals of government, it's sound fiscal policy. And during the First World War, which everyone expected started late in the summer, and everyone expected it to be over by Christmas. Why? Because that's all the money they had. War is ferociously expensive. And all wars prior had been relatively short, relatively contained. And one by one, over the First World War, the European governments went off the gold standard because they had no gold. War and gold don't mix very well. War and limited currency don't mix very well. 
When you have fiat currency, you have like this infinite blender for human parts. You can just keep shoving more and more people in. If they'd had to wage the First World War on gold, it likely would have ended by Christmas 1914, and a further 9 or 10 million people would not have died. This is how serious money is. Money is life and death for millions of people. So the social programs that were instituted by most European governments in the 19th century, Germany first and foremost among them, kept running through the First World War. Right, you know that, I don't know if you know this, guns or butter, do you want to have a war economy or do you want consumer goods? When you have fiat currency, you don't have to give people that choice. You can have your social programs, you can have a war economy, and you pay for it by printing money. Anybody, what, what's, the, what's the effect? of printing money. What does it do to prices? Who's awake? Yeah, <laughs> it goes up. Yeah, they go up. Inflation technically, according to the Austrian economists, who I'd really recommend you look into, inflation is an inflation of the money supply. The price that goes up is just an effect of the inflation. First World War, they kept the social programs going while running unsustainable wars, and they had to go off the gold standard. The First World War did not need to be fought. But the economic disasters that followed, the uncoupling of money from gold, are still being felt. 1971, in America, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society social programs were underway, costing billions and billions of dollars, fighting a war in Vietnam, which, like the First World War, did not need to be fought. Did they go to the people and say, we need money for the war, we're going to have to shut down all this other stuff? No. They went off the gold standard, just like the European nations had done through the First World War. They go off the gold standard so they don't have to ask you to choose between food and death, between life and murder, between guns and butter. Taxes in America have not been raised. They're waging a war on terror. Throughout all of human history, 174,000 tons of gold has been mined and refined. 174, just think 174. The war on terror cost 291,000 tons of gold. The cost of World War II for America, which was never invaded or bombed, save Pearl Harbor, was 15 times the amount of gold that they had in Fort Knox and the Fed. In terms of bitcoins, the war on terror costs 500 times more bitcoins than will ever be mined, and about 1,100 times more than is currently available. How is this possible? How is it possible to wage these astoundingly destructive wars with the deaths of over a million Iraqis and the displacements of a million and a half Iraqis? And in Fallujah, the genetic damage to the population as the result of these hellacious weapons is so bad that anthropologists and geneticists estimate that the population of Fallujah has been genetically destroyed for at least a generation. How is it possible? It's possible because money is unlimited. It's possible because not more than one in 1,000 or 10,000 people know that they lost their house because they cheered the war. They don't know that. They, they can't trace that. They're certainly not educated about that. Why, why would you educate people about that if you want all the evils of warmongering political power? So when governments can print money, they don't have to ask the people to make rational decisions or to balance things, right? The basis of economics. All human desires are infinite. All Resources are finite. But with the magic of the printing press, with the magic of typing whatever you want into your own bank account, you go into this crazy psychotic world of limitless capacity for destruction and debt. So if in 2003, the American government had gone to its population and said, hey, that's a damn bad guy, right? Bad guy. I think we're all in agreement on that. Very bad guy. Would be nice if they hadn't armed him before, but bad guy. Why don't we go to war? People say, I'm not sure about that. They say, well, that'll be $75,000 per household. Please and thank you very much. How many warmongers would be left? Oh, really? 75,000? Uh, no, that's okay. Blessed are the peacemakers. 
Let's, uh, let's find another route. The TARP bailout for the banks. Hey, do you feel like bailing out Daddy Warbucks and his gold monocle? Would that be fun for you? Great. $2,200 per person. $4,400 for every working person. Want to send that money to us? Really? No, I don't think so. But they can just keep doing things without referring to the will of the people because they didn't invent the photocopier, but they sure know how to use it. The government has no money of its own. Bitcoin is intrinsically limited. You can't make a Bitcoin. Oh, you can mine it and buy it. The government can't print a Bitcoin. The government, in a Bitcoin currency universe, has to actually go to the people and ask them what they want. The government will actually have to do what it claims it does. Serve the people. Ask the people. Not with votes. Votes. You only ever get to vote for people who've already been bought and paid for. Who is up there on the podium in the presidential debates, whether you go to Europe or to America or South America or China, anywhere? The only people who are up there are people who've got enough money to run. And where are they getting the money from? They're getting the money from special interests at your expense. This is not a theory. I mean, this is fairly well documented. If we have a Bitcoin universe, you don't get to print money for war. You don't get to print money for a prison industrial complex. You don't get to print money for a war on drugs. You have to ask the people. War on drugs on Amer in America costs hundreds of billions of dollars a year. At the most conservative estimate, hundreds of billions of dollars a year. How many people, if their moral outrage against drug use, ooh, that's bad vegetation, if their moral outrage was not subsidized by money printing and they had to pay the bills themselves, how many of them would find tolerance for people who like Pink Floyd? I think they would be all right with that. <sighs> all the people who hate drugs and love Sgt. Peppers. <laughs> so Bitcoin gives us an opportunity to reclaim the power of the people to say yes or no to what the government claims that it wants to do. Because there's this weird thing that happens in society. There's something that's happening that's cool, and then people say, well, the government can make it better. And they say, okay, well, the government can make it better. Let's have the government add to it. And then what happens is, boink, you get over to this place where suddenly the government has to do it. And then suddenly it's like only the government can do it. And this is how we think about currency now. It has to be government. Why? It's a complete anomaly. The last time the government had this much power over currency was in the waning days of the Roman Empire. When they inflated the currency so much that the gold coins only had 2 or 3% of gold left in at the end. And they were trying to pay all their mercenaries with this crap gold. And the mercenaries said, this stuff is crap. We're coming to Rome to get the gold. They Killed the Roman economy, depopulated Rome from like a million and a half people to 17,000 people in a year or two, and that was it for civilization for quite some time. When you give governments the power to control the money supply, it grows like a tumor until it extinguishes society itself. I really urge you to consider it to be that important. With Bitcoin, you can't steal it. Well, <laughs> if you leave your wallet on a park bench, it can be stolen. <laughs> but with any rudimentary security, you can't have your Bitcoin stolen. I was just speaking at a conference uh, in uh, Texas. I met some vendors who are integrating something so that if anybody tries to get a Bitcoin out of your wallet, it sends you a text message to your cell phone. You enter a PIN, and you approve the transfer. <laughs> Solved. Can't, can't steal the Bitcoins now. But that happens anywhere and everywhere. There is going to be enormous amounts of resistance to the adoption of Bitcoin, but I really believe that it is about the most peaceful revolution that we can have in this world. It's been called the Internet of Money in that it's a protocol and you can program around it, you can build anything on top of it, which the community, thousands of developers are currently doing. 
but it's better than the internet. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a non-controversial statement. It's better than the internet because the internet has not slowed the growth of governments around the world. The internet has not saved the next generation from the endless gutter hole of debt. Information empowers the people, but not with regards to political power. Political power is a monopoly of the initiation of force in a geographical area. Information don't stop bullets. But when you don't have money to fund bullets, the bullets stop. War, surveillance, as the lady was talking about before, debt, the, the, the growing fascism that is occurring throughout the Western world is all predicated on money. Imagine a football game where every time you cheered, you were charged five euros. How loud is that game going to be? Very quiet. Imagine if our primitive reptile bloodlust brain, which we all have, nothing wrong with it. Imagine if our primitive bloodlust, us versus them, tribal, base of the skull meat brain, was provoked with an enemy. Those guys are bad. They're coming to get us. We don't want the smoking gun to be in the form of a mushroom cloud. What stops that brain from cheering war? Cost. Cost stops us. Think of the environmental predation and environmental destruction that is wrought by the continual increase in the money supply. How much consumerism is driven by the fact that your money is burning a hole in your pocket? Literally, it's melting, it's evaporating, it's dying in your pocket. Convert it to something, convert it to something, buy something. How much consumer demand is stimulated by excess money being flushed into the system? How much wealth, genuine wealth, not bubble wealth, genuine wealth, how much genuine wealth is not being created? I'll give you one tiny example, then I think I have to end. Oh, the countdown. Normally, it takes like three or four security guards to get me off. But, um, there was a study that came out recently that said if, just one tiny aspect, if American regulations and controls over the economy, interferences in the economy, had stayed at 1946 levels. Now, it was not a Mad Max, Thunderdome, flaming-headed, bayoneting kind of wasteland in America in 1946. A civilized society. If Regulations had stayed that small in America, if they just stayed that size, the GDP of America would not be $15 trillion. It would be $53 trillion. This is the opportunity cost of one tiny slice of an expansion of government power. There would be no poverty. Nobody would have to worry about health care costs. Charity would take care of everyone. And there would not be, as there is in America at the moment, children born into $1.4 trillion worth of debt that they never voted for, never chose, and will spend the rest of their lives groaning under the yoke of foreign banksters to pay off. This is the alternative universe that Bitcoin can generate. So I strongly urge you to start looking into Bitcoin, start promoting it. Yes, it's great. You can make some money. You can do some cool stuff technically. But I really believe this is our best chance to save the world from a direction that it's heading, which is sadly a photocopy of the end of the Roman Empire. When you study history, you're basically watching the same movie over and over and over again with different costumes. Not a toga, it's a suit, but it's the same damn thing. Bitcoin, we can stop the tape. We can break out of the loop. We can regain power to the people. Jesus, who knew a thing or two about handling the moneylenders, <laughs> Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. I say, no. Build shall be the warmongers. And then we get peace. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks.